Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra, and it feels like things are getting fun right now. It's April. We are fully into conference play, and I feel like it's always a crazy time when winter and spring sports overlap, but now that March Madness is over, it feels like even more eyes are turning towards softball, as they should. So some quick reminders for the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. Believe in Softball is also on YouTube, so subscribe. The video is pretty cool. There are just some cool additions that we have on that channel specifically, so check it out. Okay, let's go through today's batting order. First, we'll cover our bases, give you some news and call-outs from around the softball world. Then we'll head into today's interview with Kelly Inouye Perez. She's just always been one of my favorites to watch, and I think a lot of people feel that way. It's for a reason. She's one of the best to do it, and I'm just excited for us all to soak up the greatness. Then we'll end things with the foul tip of the week, which are tips to help us keep going and get better. Let's get started. Covering our bases. BetOnline is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info and odds. Find all of the latest sports developments, including this week's odds for the Masters Championship and the start to the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's super easy to get started, so join today. Learn why everyone is saying Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on popular sports and games. Bet Online, where the game starts. In terms of team to watch, there's one program that I really want to call out for us to keep an eye on, and that is San Diego State. This is Stacey Newman's first season as head coach. She obviously was there as an assistant for years under Van Wyke, but this is her first time at the helm of the program. And they've started off really well. They started Mountain West play 9-0, and which is the first time since 2006 they've done that. That also means that the first three weekends they've swept teams. Also the first time they've done that since the Mountain West went to the three-game series format back in 2012. And with all this being said, they made it into the top 25 D1 softball rankings this week, which is also really exciting. And for example, when it comes to players, you know, pitcher Maggie Ballant has been the Mountain West pitcher of the week six out of eight possible times this season. It's pretty impressive. Like of out of an entire conference, you're the one who eh, three quarters of the time you're getting the award. Not bad. And I have to say, I give a lot of credit to this literally an Olympic coaching staff (laughs) that they've put together. You know, Victoria Hayward, the UW alum who played for Team Canada, she's really taking on the hitters and showing them what they can do. And even defensively, obviously with the outfielders, but then Rachel Garcia, the volunteer assistant coach also been calling pitches for the Aztecs, which is pretty awesome. And then of course you have Stacey Newman, who is one of the best to ever play softball. So what a group for this team to learn from. And we're seeing that come to fruition hundred percent. They're also going to play UNLV this weekend. They're going to Vegas. So both of these teams were picked to win the conference in the preseason polls. So it's going to be a good one. Definitely recommend checking it out. The other thing I wanted to call out too, and this is something that D1 softball reported on, and I saw pictures on Twitter and I I just think it's great. And it's the good causes that are out there in softball and that the softball community supports. So just a couple, all 13 SEC programs wore teal on their jerseys on Saturday. And this is part of the All for Alex Day, which honors the legacy of Alex Wilcox, who was a member of the 2018 Mississippi State team, and she fought ovarian cancer before she passed away that summer. And this is something that LSU head coach Beth Tarina has been a longtime advocate for the cause after her mother survived ovarian cancer. And just to see the entire conference participate in something like this, and come together outside the white lines. There were huge lines waiting to get into games to celebrate on this day. It's just a really good feeling. And one of the cool things I think about softball and these people. Also Notre Dame held its annual strikeout cancer weekend and head coach Deanna Gump's daughter was diagnosed with leukemia back in 2010. They've raised money ever since for children with cancer and their families. So another fantastic cause. And you know what? Cancer sucks. Like I lost somebody really close to me, a really close friend to cancer. My grandfather had cancer as well. And I just, it sucks. And I feel for anyone who's been touched by it in any way. I think these are two examples just from one weekend 
of how softball just makes a greater impact in the community. And the softball community is really good at this kind of support. So it just, to me, deserves some spotlight. But a team that has been getting all kinds of spotlight for good reason is UCLA. This is a team that has been so exciting to watch. Their 24-game win streak that they have right now, as of the third week in Pac-12, they haven't lost since the primetime Florida State game back on February 20th. This means they swept the first three series of Pac-12 play, which were all ranked teams, by the way, Arizona, Washington, and Oregon. And with Arizona, it was the first time they had done the shutout three times in a row to them since the 89-90 seasons, which, by the way, was Kelly Inouye Perez's freshman year. So Kelly, I also passed the 700 wins mark as a head coach at UCLA, which is pretty wild. There have only been three, right, with the Bruins. It's been Sharon Backus, Sue Inquist, and Kelly I, and it's pretty impressive. The pitching staff, this is what I'm really impressed with, especially. After this past weekend, so as of April 4th, let's just go through some numbers. As a staff, ERA under 1.2. That leads the Pac-12, and it's second in the nation. They have over 300 strikeouts, which leads the Pac-12. And they lead the nation in strikeout to walk ratio with 7.75. In terms of individuals, Megan Framo leads the pack in strikeouts and saves. She's second in wins and she's top five in ERA. Holly Azevedo, on the other hand, is third in the pack in wins and top five in ERA and strikeouts. And then there's Lauren Shaw, who is leading the pack in ERA with 0.56 so far this season. So these are just three incredibly competitive and elite arms that the Bruins are working with here. And they've been able to achieve these results so far this season without some of their most decorated players. Like Aaliyah Jordan went down back in February. She's out for the year. It was just announced. She's granted a seventh year, so we can expect more Bruin magic from her. But no one knows Bruin magic better than today's guest. So let's head into the interview. She is the UCLA head coach, two-time Pac-12 slash 10 coach of the year, Eight-time national champion with the Bruins, two as a head coach, three as an assistant, three as a player, three-time All-Pac-10 catcher, and everybody's hair goals, Kelly Inouye Perez. <laughs> coach. Hi. Hey, hey, thank you for having me. Of course. I'm, I'm super excited to have you. And I feel like out of all your accomplishments, that last one I mentioned, the hair goals, like you're representing oh very gosh. well today. <laughs> you are so funny. I'm fortunate. It's all my mom. I got a lot of hair. That's the way that works. But um, I'm, I, I think there was a lot of other things that I could definitely say I'm a lot more proud of. So thank you. Though. <laughs> I'm sure. But it does come up, I feel like on Twitter, at least at some point, like every year, just because your ponytail is always immaculate, like the <laughs> curls, the shine, it is it is goals. It really thank is. I thank you. Like I said, I I'm fortunate it's game day and I'm fortunate for whatever reason, my hair curls well. So it is what it is. But I, I think, like I said, there's a lot of other things that I would <laughs> love to be able to talk to. Uh, but I appreciate the shout out. That's for sure. Yes. I mean, there's yeah. So many things that we could talk about. I might just like text you later for your hair products that you use, but when it comes to actually playing, do you subscribe to the idea of like, if you look good, you play good, you play good, you know, you win. And then that whole thing kind of plays into itself. You know, I've, I've been, first of all, I've been really fortunate to have just great coaching my whole career. Yeah. And, um, and from a very young age, all coaches would always have an attention to detail on how we walk, talked and act. So tuck in your uniform and, you know, and, and without getting really detailed, just be presentable, do your hair. Don't, you know, just be presentable in all that you do and take care of your equipment and take care of each other. So there has been, um, I've been surrounded by just, just great people that always took pride in, in, in same, like what you said, you know, look good, play good. But it's just taking pride in representing something that is bigger than you, more than just it's about me getting shout outs or I want to look a certain way. It's it's more that I'm representing. I'm representing so many. And so just being able to have that attention to detail on rep what we call representing with class is, is, is what it, what it's all about. And I've been fortunate from a very young age when I first started playing ball, you know, like those those little things mattered. And so now. It's something that I continue to do and reinforce with my current girls today, because I think the, the, the meaning behind it is in life, everyone's judged, right? And you can definitely say, don't worry about what other people think. Um, and that's true. But you also can say first impressions, you only get one. So your ability to be 
presentable and represent with class. You know, first impressions are big and you want to make sure that the people can say that, you know, she represents with class. She obviously takes pride in, in, in what she's about. And that's what it's about more than anything is I, I'm fortunate to represent UCLA softball. And there's so many great people, players, alumni, supporters of the program that are always going to make sure that I'm doing my job. And a big part of that is representing all of them. I've noticed that as a consistency, just in general with all the alumni that I've spoken to as well. Like we've been fortunate to have like Natasha Watley on the show, uh, Stacey Newman, Rachel Garcia, right? And that does mm-hmm. seem just like this consistent thread that is there in terms of just the culture of, of UCLA. And it's crazy to think you've been part of the Bruin bubble for 33 years. Wow. I know. I stopped counting because <laughs> I, I, I promise you, I can remember what it feels like to play on the College World Series stage. I mean, we, Lisa and I still talk about, I remember what it feels like. So, and it's fortunate that I'm able to still sit here on this playground, you know, doing something that I'm passionate about, surrounded by people that are just as passionate, but um it's a big part of it, you know, and I, I, a big part of my story is why I chose UCLA because at the time in the recruiting process, you know, my travel ball girls and teammates, we went on visits. There was seven of us and we went on trips all over the country. Not really. We were more West side. I'm going to keep it real, but um, (laughs) we, and we, I had options to be able to go with my friends to certain schools. And I was at the time, unfortunately, timing wise, I was the only one that was recruited by UCLA in my class. And and it was, it was such a, it's such an important time in your life where your friends are so important, your teammates, you know, we were winning championships, but I really stopped and thought about the opportunity that, you, you know, what UCLA could provide for me. And I have to have trust and faith that my friends would be friends for life. And that was a difficult time at 18 years old, making a decision about the rest of your life. Who cares? I want to be with my friends. And that was a critical time. So the good news is being a part of UCLA, you know, my first time on campus was, I was, I was only 17 and, and all my friends that at the time went to different colleges, still in my wedding, still, you know, we raised our kids together. We still get together on a a yearly basis. So, you know, true friendship lasts a lifetime, but the opportunities that you have for yourself, sometimes you have to take, take those, even though it, it may be a little scarier and, you know, it's, it's may not be your comfort zone. And that's looking out for the bigger picture, which is hard to do when you're young, but yes, so I've been apart for a long time. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. We say that this is a lifetime decision, you know, whatever Mm. school you end up choosing on that feels right for you. But I feel like you're sort of the epitome of that, right? Because it really has been your, your lifetime. Um, Well, I think, I think I'm fortunate because I think, uh, first of all, I had an extended eligibility, which is kind of a common theme in this generation, which wasn't really common back then. You know, I had a red shirt year and three shoulder surgeries. And a big part of why I'm in this position is, you know, I, you know, what I want to probably do beyond this is, is really get into the sports psychology of injured athletes, because, mm-hmm. you know, you make decisions on playing softball. I want to go play softball and I want to be on that world series stage. And, you know, there's an education piece behind it that, you know, if it is all taken away, what do you do? And I had that moment where my whole career changed with an injury. And I mean, I was devastated. I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know who I was. And I had to really check in with a sports psychologist to, to figure out my identity beyond just the softball player that is just what I've been doing. So um, it is a life decision. You know, there is an experience in softball, but there's an education and a degree that you get. But the most important thing is all the lessons that you learn definitely will help you. So for me, I always say surround yourself that are with people that are like you in your college experience. And it can't just be about softball. It's everybody in your community that are striving for things and pushing you to, to do more. So I think that's a big part why I chose UCLA is, is academically, athletically in LA. It's a location that is competitive and it's challenging. And, and I didn't really know that how much I would, you know, how much the bigger picture would, and it wasn't my goal either to be a softball coach. I wasn't, I didn't go to UCLA to so say, I'm going to be a softball coach, but man, my life experiences at UCLA definitely prepared me to be a leader in some capacity. And I love that I get to continue to stay in the room bubble. I think that's why we all find a way to stay close to the game, right? Depending on what it is, obviously you've chosen this path and it's worked out very well for you in coaching, but people do all sorts of different things. Like Natasha Watley's got her foundation, right? And she's, she's doing broadcasting too. Like that's, that's the connection, but it's what you're saying. It's because of the lessons that we learn why we want to stay connected for so long. Well, and I think, you know, I say this to my girls all the time that athletics is, is just one avenue that is going to, it's going to, it's a challenging path. It's a difficult path and it takes guts. 
to be able to get up on a stage and be challenged with the opportunity to fail with a lot of people watching. But what you gain, the work ethic, the time management, you know, just just once again, how to manage success and failure and get back up again. Those are all those qualities that in any profession, you know, that you're going to be able to to carry and, and help an organization, a family, you know, a in, in any any possible organization, the teamwork aspect, understanding how to identify with your role and be great at your role, you know, wanting to always be better and make that starting lineup. But it's there's so many things that allow us to become strong, powerful females in on on a stage. Like I say, so I remind them all the time, you know, remember what you signed up for, you know, <laughs> like it's it's a hard path. But the lessons learned of success and failure is what I love about the job more than anything. I love seeing great softball, but I actually really enjoy seeing athletes being challenged and then putting the work in and getting back up and having the guts to do it again. That to me, that resilient, that resilient, never give up, never quit, um, just fire from within. Oh, I love that. And that's not to say I love to see failure. I just know that we all are going to get challenged in life. And my coach I is it's not what happens you know, in any event, but it's what you do next. It is your defining moment. And to me, that's my favorite part of the game is softball provides that. I mean, it'll challenge you. It's got a sick sense of humor. It'll challenge you to the point where you want to just quit, but it's those moments that you keep moving forward. That's what's going to help you beyond the white lines. A hundred percent. And I know when we had a chance to talk leading up to your series against Washington, um, I, I wrote down a lot of, of coach isms, by the way, <laughs> because I enjoyed them a lot <laughs> during our conversation. But one thing that you pointed out that this kind of reminds me of too, is you're talking about challenges, but different types of challenges. Aaliyah yeah. Jordan, for example, you were saying how, even though she's had this injury and that's been a, its own type of challenge that what she's bringing to the team as a teammate, and you're talking about teamwork and just being able to make an impact essentially and bring value mm-hmm. no matter what, is is huge so that that makes me think of that but that is very embedded into the culture which makes sense you know just i don't know what day it is but just this past weekend i was i would be we have a thing where we're after games we give shout outs and um every day you know we've been really fortunate you know we've had some big time players out of the lineup in 2022 so and kinsley washington who was our hottest player obviously Aaliyah is was our most decorated best player both of them were down and out of the lineup Yet both of them were at the front of the dugout. Both of them were talking to the hitters. Both of them were giving advice and corrections. Both of them, I mean, the attention to detail and the energy and how they were demanding that everybody get involved with cheering as fifth year, fifth and sixth year seniors, you know? So I was telling the young girls because they were giving, the girls gave them shout outs. And I said, don't you, don't ever forget this. You have two of the most decorated players in the program that are being challenged right now. They don't get to do what they want. Yet you see them at the front of the dugout giving to their teammates and you freshmen and sophomores, don't you forget this. This is how this program runs is no one feels sorry for themselves, but everybody now their role has shifted from being able to be the one to doing whatever they can in the smallest of capacity. And the ener- I have Aaliyah and Kinsley. I had to like move them for a sec because they were competing against each other on some challenge. And they're like, no, I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm like, what are you guys, what are you doing? And they're right there in the dugout. There's hitters that would love to get up and see, but Aliyah and Kinsley are right there and they're competing on trying to figure out the first one to get this or that. And I was, I, I love it, but it is definitely embedded in the culture that take pride in doing something to be able to help the program be successful. And I, and to have two of those um, be challenged and give back, the team was recognizing that. And that is what builds culture within a program. It's not what I say. It's our actions that teach the younger girls on how we do things at UCLA. Another thing that I loved that you had said before too, that this also reminds me of is that nobody can have an ego on the team. Like everybody finds a role again, that impact that they can leave. But I also feel like obviously there's a certain level of intensity, right? At UCLA, because this is a, a program that demands excellence. So it's sort of these two things kind of existing at, at one time. How do you balance those two things? Well, I think, I think, you know, and that's another thing, um, I think the bigger picture, every, every coach in the country would love to say, yeah, yeah, right. No egos, but you're always going to have your best player that may challenge you. And you as a coach have to make decisions on how you manage, manage that. And the one thing that I have um, been a part of with Sharon Backus and Sue Enquist is nobody is bigger than the game. Nobody, not, not anybody, no matter how big of a name or how impactful they are to the lineup, nobody. So it makes it very easy that this is a program where it doesn't matter who you are. This is the standards. 
And there are people that are held accountable and that ultimately is my job. So, and it's not my personal decision because that gets tough. I want to win games at times, but the, the lessons of how we go about things is important. So we, we actually had a silly conversation where I'm going to call out names because she could laugh about it, but there are Bruins that were like, yeah, do you remember that time that I got pulled from a game or coach? I do remember that game and, and Brie Perez, right. She, and she's my starting shortstop. She's my lead off. She's all everything. I mean, she has been a constant in our lineup yet. There was a moment where she didn't run something out. And, you know, it's a, it's an absolute in our program. She popped it up, didn't run it out, super frustrated. And, and she got pulled. Right. And everyone, everyone was like, you're pulling Brie Perez, but it was, it wasn't even emotional. It was like, and, and I laughed, I said the lesson learned, cause there was a bunch of freshmen, they were hitting and Brie was like, yeah, I'll remember that moment. And I said, the lesson learned guys is not that, oh, coach, I will pull Brie Perez or Brie Perez actually had a bad moment. I'm like in life, not to be so deep, but I be, I really truly believe in this, you know, you, with every action, there's a consequence. And sometimes the consequence is worth it. Meaning Brie was so frustrated that she popped up and she knew she could get pulled from the game. And, and unfortunately that's where she was to that point. And it was funny because it was against Stanford like a couple of years. That's why it got brought up. Cause she's like, remember Stamp, remember the Stanford game? And I was like, uh, no. And she was like, I do. And I went, Oh, <laughs> and, we kind of, and we started laughing, but they also showed the younger kids like, well, Brie Perez got pulled. And that's, there's been moments where in, like I said, it's not my ego. It's not me saying, oh, it's, I'm the boss and you're the player. It's more, hey, do what you're going to do, but understand there's consequences. And if you get to that point where you impact the team, man, that's rough. For, yeah. So you better yeah. stop and think about how you're going to impact. I didn't make that decision. You did. And that allows for the culture to stay intense. Like we're all getting after it. Everyone's working hard, yet there's an accountability that nobody's bigger than the game. And that ultimately is my job on how to win in the bigger down the road is, is just the consistency of how, once again, we represent with class, you know, and that, and in the beginning, I'm going to be honest with you in the beginning parts of my coaching career, that was hard. Cause I was, I want to win, which I, yeah. you know, my perception of winning is you got to keep the best players in, but it, it's very, very real that it's more about consistency with culture and how you manage your people that allow for us not to be distracted by these things. And then, and then everybody gets it. So if I don't, someone makes that decision, I'm like, man, we got you. You were to that point dang, you know, and then, Hold, hold themselves accountable and then get yourself back in and hopefully you learn a lesson. If it's happening multiple times, that's a whole different story. But fortunately, I don't get to see that a lot because lessons are learned on, oh, wow, I never want that to happen again. It's a hundred percent right. I mean, I'm a big proponent, for example, of when it comes to, when you're looking at mechanics and different things like that, not to be cookie cutter, right. As a coach, however, standards are cookie cutter or in the sense that this is consistent across, it doesn't matter who you are. Right. And it's like, I don't know if like, if you don't have that aspect to the culture, you, you aren't successful. You could have the best players, right. It doesn't matter, but I don't think it gets to the type of level that UCLA has had without that. Yeah. I think it's difficult for any program. Um, if you don't have some just absolute, I call them absolutes in the program that yeah. everyone understands. Like if, if, if it's inconsistent, then people will make decisions without even knowing if it was right or wrong or, or why all of a sudden they're getting judged for it now. But I think, so as a coaching staff, I'm very fortunate to have a solid coaching staff that we've come together with. And then within that leadership, within the program that everyone's really clear. And that's our, their job is to teach the younger girls of how we go about business. And it's mainly the things that are in your control. I never said you have to get a hit with two strikes. I mean, come on, but it is about how you manage success and failure. And then we break it down to the details. So it gets very, very clear. And I think that part is, is it, I, I agree with you. Any program that doesn't have that, you're right. You're letting the inmates run the asylum and it depends on the mood and with highs and lows of a season and success and failure, it's very difficult to gain control back when things are going in the wrong direction. And then, then you try to implement it. That's, that's tough. And I think that's the same thing in life, right? Leadership and parenting and coaching, your ability to identify with what the most important parts of your program are so that the girls and staff and everybody's clear. If they're clear about the bigger picture, then they just go about business. And if you get to that point where you make a decision and you have, you don't run it out, like Bri is perfect. She's a great student. She's a great, she's just everything about her. But in that moment, she got to that point and it was her wake up call afterwards. She flipped it and she got right back on track because she was disappointed. She let the team down, yeah. you know, and, but anyways, yeah, we can go on for days, but I think in, in, in anything, having a, having a structure from top down 
um, is the key to success in any in any organization. Well, and with your staff in particular, I mean, first of all, outstanding, right? right. But but the, just the fact that there's the UCLA DNA yeah. in yeah. every single person also, I think, just speaks volumes. I mean, when you have Lisa, right? It's like the goat, <laughs> but then Kirk Walker as well. Like it's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, and I and I think I I we are the only program in the country that has, you know, all, you know. Bruins from within, and that could be good and bad, right? You always want to bring in new ideas and new people, but I think um, that is obviously a big, a big part of our success. Is when we talk about Bruin family, we're we're, we're definitely living it, and um, I think the loyalty to the program. We're all we're fortunate. I'm fortunate. My staff, Lisa Fernandez, can go. Lisa and Kirk can go coach anywhere in the country. Yet they're loyal to the program, and we're loyal to each other. And I think that part of it, there's no ego. It is UCLA softball. It is not Kelly and Oi Perez. It is not Lisa Fernandez. It is not Kirk. It is we are here to be able to help and do our part in carrying on the tradition of this program. And so there's no egos from the top either. You know, I get to be the head coach, which we laugh because I get, I have a lot more responsibility, you know, as far as beyond the white lines, but man, I am so fortunate to have a staff that can really, they master their craft you know, and as a result, the girls feel it. We're very healthy with our culture and our ability to manage situations because everyone has their area and a bigger picture. It's all for what's best for the program. As a coach, I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah. The Jolly Ranchers are just the cherry on top. (laughs) My gosh, Kirk, that's a whole other podcast on Kirk's diet and nutrition. I mean, he's, he looks phenomenal and he's, but he's, he's, he's such the big brother of the program. You know, it doesn't even matter. Age is irrelevant. I mean, he's the big brother of the program. He, he's been here the longest as far as, um, you know, he, I, he was actually just graduated when I was a freshman in the program. So he was helping. And then he went to go coach at Oregon state for 18 years and built that program up. So for me to get him back, just to help come take care of the program was, a, was a great day for UCLA softball and where he is in his life. Cause he's so engaged in so many more things that he did his thing. He went and did his head coach thing. He took them to the world series and then he came back and he's here. He's here giving back still throwing BP endlessly. Um, but once again, loyalty to the program, which helps build culture. Speaks a lot to just the experience that not only the players have, but the coaches have uh, yeah. in your program too, to after all that time, make that decision. Like, yep, I'm going home. You yeah. know, like it, it is huge. It, yeah. it says well, I mean, a lot of great things. Lisa, Lisa can go anywhere and she gets pursued everywhere. And, you know, I, I never know when the right opportunity will be there for her. And she says that she's like, you know, if an opportunity comes that is life changing for my family, then I would have to make a decision then. But until then, um, you know, we've been fortunate. Lisa and I have been playing ball since we were 10 and 11 years old. Not crazy. So we've been a pitcher catcher combo our whole lives and, and have just, gone through this whole softball thing yet have also gone through life raising our families and and the highs and lows you know UCLA is in a good place but UCLA has had some lows but we've that that bond that I've created with her to be able to go through the hard times big losses big downs in the program but continue to move forward to take care of these kids and bring in the right kids into our program I credit her a lot because she's in charge of recruiting so she goes after a, a, a certain DNA it's not just who can throw it the hardest and run the fastest or hit it the farthest, but it's the complete package of a person. And that takes time to be able to find. So there's definitely some, there's talent coast to coast now, which is exciting for our sport, but we really, what we call go after a top 1% because it's not easy being a Bruin academically, athletically in a location like LA with the history and tradition. I mean, who wants to sign up for that? It takes a certain person that, that wants to help carry on this tradition and represent UCLA versus there's a lot of opportunities to go be a first someplace else. And that will be more about And there's nothing wrong with that, but some people want to be in the record books and be the one and be the first that's, so we have to have a certain girl. If it's coming in here and all about you, this may not be the best place for you because we are so, um, we're so focused on the team and the culture and the tradition more so than any one individual. So I credit Lisa a lot. She brings in the right people, which is why the program is so successful. Yeah. She also, she, you know, you say like, if you want to just be the one, it might not be the right place. It's like, people might think of her as the one in a lot of ways, but it's also like, but actually that happened by having that other mentality that you're talking about. Right. And yeah. you know, better than anyone, the battery, it's so cool to see you guys, you know, as a battery now, like you're doing life yeah. together coaching. It's just like the coolest thing ever. But you know, one thing that I think is really cool to remember is when Lisa chose UCLA, there were four other pitchers at UCLA at the time. 
So, and that's a big part why you threw out my little accolade of winning three championships and the fourth we lost to Arizona in the championship, you know, like one, nothing. So, so we, you know, we could have had, I could have easily had four because at that time, I mean, they, well, I won't even say the day, don't want to my age myself, but back then we had the top pitchers in the country and they were all committed to winning. So they all could have gone and been the one. So there is a history and tradition of wanting to come together to win versus being the one. And, you know, no, everybody wants to play. Everyone wants to be the one, but there is a, there is a, um, a part of the culture is I want to be a part of it and help. And we all gain success versus just going off and being that, that one player. So when Lisa was here, she didn't even pitch a whole lot in her freshman year, you know, and, and, and people would go, really, I didn't know that, you know, yet she was an all American as a hitter and a third baseman. And she did pitch some innings, but she did not And then her sophomore year, she started to pitch more, but it was her junior and senior year that she became that really big two-way player because there were other pitches that were helping UCLA win championships at the time. So she's, she can reinforce that she's lived it because she had opportunities to go to other schools and be the one. And, you know, when she stepped back and said the same thing, which is what she encourages in recruiting is you got to figure out what you want. If you want to be just the record holder at that school and go do it, then go do it. Cause that's, that's something that that's what you, that's what you want. But if you want to win championships, then we've got to be able to pull together a team that have a selfless, you know, focus on how we can all help each other accomplish that. So, you know, Lisa's a living example of that because she could have gone to so many schools and been to all everything, but she came to the most decorated and carried on the tradition. Same thing with Rachel Garcia, same thing with Amanda Free, same thing with Megan Langenfeld. There's so many, now it's Megan Ferrero, but there's so many that have had the ability to to carry on the tradition instead of just going and being the one. We're fortunate. We're definitely fortunate. I know one thing that, that Rachel mentioned when she came on the show is the champ camps that uh, Lisa puts them through. And I okay. was like, that's awesome. Okay. You want to hear a funny story that just happened yesterday. So Lisa has been, um, first of all, she's obviously had an amazing career and I've never seen someone work as hard as her. I'm talking even um, aerobically. That girl can get on a yeah. bike and burn 800 calories and just sweat. Like, and I sit there and say, like, like, how do you do it? Like, we could all get on and ride for 45 minutes, 30, whatever. Oh, she'll go on for like an hour and a half and go, because she'll say, Nobody, I know when I go in those extra, those extra minutes, nobody in the world is working as hard as I am because everybody will stop. Right. So we're like, okay, crazy. Right. Yeah. She does that. <laughs> but then, so she's working out again. She had, she went and she was the Olympian. She had her children and she had workouts, but she didn't really get to that back to that training as we all do with as moms. Oh, she's back in it now. So she's training. She looks great. She's competitive. So yesterday was champ camp for the pitchers. Okay. Which is just like a challenging workout, but she got up to the field early and she, she's like, she went up, we have Pelotons at the field. So she was going at it in this workout and she was telling me, she's like, I'm in this workout and I'm thinking about the pitchers. And I just, I started to go even further and I was just pushing myself and I was thinking how I was going to push him at champ camp. Cause you know, she was doing it ahead of time. So she texts the girls after she got off and said, you know, get, Hey guys, champ camp today. And just, so you know, I already beat all of you in my workout. So they were all laughing, going, ha 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 ha, you know? And then Megan came to the field yesterday and um, Lisa was telling me after practice, she goes, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to be honest with you, coach. I was not mentally in it to get ready for champ camp. But when I got your text that you beat us, flip my mentality and I'm ready to go head to head with champ camp. So that is still innately in there too, that Lisa, she's just unique. There's people that can tell you what to do and they have experience, but there's people that are in it with you. She is in it with them. And she's living it and she's sharing experiences. And this generation is open to taking that and listening. And they're so inspired and they're so motivated. And and there is an attention to detail that is hard. It is hard to be able to constantly say that you could be more, but we are successful right now in 2022 because those pitchers are in it with Lisa and they're doing a phenomenal job of buying into the process. So I know that's, it was just a funny story that I was laughing that that's, that was the motivation, Megan. I was dying. I'm like, oh, you guys are so funny, but she has them dialed in, which is really, really cool. It sounds very on brand. I will say <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy about that story. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> that's awesome. I Well, speaking of Lisa and just like her example, I remember another thing you brought up too, in terms of the pitching staff is something you look at is the Lisa Fernandez stat. Yeah. Meaning if, if you give up a hit, the next one's got to be out. Like that's something that Lisa was phenomenal at. And that's something you look at with your pitchers. And I thought yeah. that was incredible. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that, that is a pillar. I think um, instead of I, I had, we had come up with this, I came up with the, the stat actually, because 
there's one thing to say, just stop the bleeding or to be able to say, oh, well, Lisa did it. So you guys should. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, so the way I described it is there's something about what allows pictures to be successful. So a lot of times pictures can give up a big hit and then the emotion and the frustration or the umpire shrinks the zone or things happen and you see the emotion because pictures have cameras right on them. So, and I talked about that. That's real. I get it. It's frustrating, but the defining moment isn't in that, that somebody beat you, but the defining moment is what you do next. And that's where Lisa shined. So she didn't have the best rise drop change. She didn't have, she wasn't the fastest throwing pitcher on the planet, but yet where she became really, really, really um, just, she separated herself from the pack was what happened next. So that next batter. So the way in a storytelling, it's not do it because Lisa did it. If you want to be great, be like Lisa, because everybody could go, uh, I'm not Lisa. <laughs> but if I simply were to say what, what allowed her to be great, you guys, she didn't have the best everything, but man, when something happened, what she did, she dialed in and she got really focused and I would feel badly for the next batter. And you could see their minds kind of change from, well, you just stop the bleeding or get over it or throw strikes or get better to, okay, but what could I do to do that? So the attention to detail, what happens after is the Lisa Fernandez dad. So our team, our dugout, everybody focuses on. So if somebody gives up a hit, we get fired up to see what they're going to do next. And I'm going to tell you, we, there's an, as I shared with you before, the enemy has a vote, right? You could yeah. pound the zone. You could pound it right after being very brave and still give up another hit. But we give you credit that you came right back and challenged rather than the walk show or the drama or the frustration or, you know, all of that, which comes with failure. It's difficult, but your ability to get tougher. Oh, now we're looking for that. That is the Lisa Fernandez stat that you just competed. And if for whatever reason, the opponent, the enemy has a vote and we're not able to get out of it, but at least you competed, the man, we give you props. We may have to pull you on that day but we give you props for being able to compete right after that moment. And that's, those are the types of things to be able to have a living example. And, you know, Lisa's not saying it like, be like me, just get the next out. It's more storytelling of what made her great. And then Lisa, what did you do to focus on that next batter? And then she got, then I could lead her into the story. And then, you know, the pitchers now are just looking at her like, okay, I want to do that. I, tell me how to help me do that. And that's, that's kind of how we work together is Lisa and I have so many stories and memories um, that Lisa's just a worker, but there is a secret sauce about what defined her that I think is bleeding into the pictures here in, um, in this generation. It's super fun. I love that because it's not just the what, like you said, the stop the bleeding. That is such a high level, you know, what does that mean, right? It's the how, how to do it. Like that's, I think, and that's like next layer of coaching, really, like right. to, what, to your point, like that is going deeper with it to actually in the mental game. And like, that's what keeps popping up in this, you know, entire conversation is the mental game behind everything right. being the key. And, and I, I think every coach, um, definitely, you know, I, I have a saying and not to be disrespectful, but I was, my worst coaching moments is when I was captain obvious, you know, captain obvious, you know, don't do this or get the bunt down or play catch, or we need to do this. It's like, anyone can be captain obvious. Anyone can look at my team and be captain obvious, but I actually flip it and do the opposite, like, you know, own it and move on. Yeah. And then work on it though. Cause if you continue, if you continue to make the same mistake and I keep you in the lineup, that's the definition of insanity where, you know, the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So, but I think what's more important because as athletes, nobody likes to be called out for doing something wrong. Okay. But it's what's empowering is to own it. I made a mistake and I'm going to do something about it and move on. And if you can do that in softball, in the real world, in relationships, to be able to just own the fact that, you know, I made a mistake and I'm going to do something about it, that is where you gain respect versus just being told that you're, you didn't do a great job and having a bad attitude. Now what? Now I'm just in a bad mood and I'm, now I'm frustrated, but own it, set the path to it. And that's why I have the girls journal a lot. So it's not Captain Obvious telling them what they're doing wrong, but I have them focus on goals that are in their control. Go for it. Come back and talk to yourself. Hmm. If it's a no, I didn't accomplish it. Then what are you going to do about it? Now I have an opinion and sometimes definitely we will, we will be involved in the process, but what's more important is can they figure out what it is, what their purpose is today and then be able to set a plan that, that is in their control to see if it leads to outcome. And that's why, you know, one of our sayings this year is follow your word. You know, everybody wants to be great, but your ability to follow the path to how to be great. I'm having you check yourself. And when you hear yourself actually say, I want to do this. However, you're not committed to the process. 
And I don't even check them at times. It's just let them hear them com- own conversations. That's more impactful than me telling them what they need to do and then and the process and not get to it. It's them talking to themselves. That's how they're going to continue to succeed is being true to their word. This is what I want. This is how I go get it. Didn't get it yet. I'm going to keep on working. I, I experienced success because I did it. I was very clear about how I went about the process. Yep. The one thing that you mentioned before too is like wanting, especially pitchers to be able to feel big, to feel big, to be successful. And what you're saying right now too, the accountability, it's like, I think some people fear accountability because they're afraid that they may feel small when that happens. But in reality, when you are empowered to do that and hold yourself accountable, that right. actually allows you to feel big. We, we've had some um, interesting conversations and, you know, coaching is long coaching. There's different, I always try to find different ways to say different things and nobody, nobody likes to fail. Let's just be real. Okay. So, but what we talk about is what failure creates. So we talk about that there is obviously frustration, but when we get down to it, you know, especially when you're on a stage, it could cause embarrassment, you know, like you put so much work in and you should, and with all the information on the net and I mean, there's, how do you not be successful? Cause there's so much information. So we talk about embarrassment, like what is embarrassment? You know, when, when you're not able to do something that you believe that you're capable of, or others believe that you're capable of. So we talk about just some basics. Let me just take this and try to break it down quickly that there is a physical response, right? You may get, you may, and when you get embarrassed, your heart may start, you know, racing, or you may get, you may get flush. Um, there's, you know, there's the thought process of just, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, the, I, the failure aspect. So we, we talk about it, but then we talk about what should you do? So when you're feeling these things, okay, I'm embarrassed. My heart starts racing. I'm uh, all those things. My thoughts start racing. So we, we talk about being able to come back and take a deep breath and really come back to what are you having control right now? So in the one time in our time zone right now, what do you have control? That's the past. Oh my gosh, that was so embarrassing. I'm so frustrated, but what are you going to do next? And being able to talk to, I said, you know, the, just a simple question. What if there were, you, you weren't embarrassed? What if you just, something happened and you weren't embarrassed and you just moved on. How do you think you would play if there was no embarrassment? There was no fear of failure. How would you think you, how do you, how would you play? And, you know, they can look at you like, well, that's not easy, but I'm just asking the question. We would be more freed up. We wouldn't worry about the future. We wouldn't care about the past. You know, we wouldn't focus on what other people think. We wouldn't check social media. I'm like, yeah, could you imagine that world where you took control of yourself? And you didn't get caught in the past or the future or what other people think. You just lived in the moment to give yourself the best chance to get after it. So I'm going to be real. Embarrassment is real. It, everybody feel, everybody experiences it. Everyone fears failure. Nobody sits there and says, oh, I have no problem with it. But it's what you do with it next that is going to be able to get you back on track. And that's so hard. That's why we practice it constantly. Like, I get it. I get where you are. What are you going to do next? I completely, yep. It wasn't fair. That's hard. Blah, blah, blah. What are you going to do? What are you going to do next? So I don't ever go backwards with the why. Why didn't, why did that happen? Oh God, what are you going to do next? And I think that has been a really big part of, um, and there was a turning point at, at one point with Bubba Nichols. It was so funny. Harry came up with this big, I'm like, I get, we're not, we're, we're struggling, not because of this, this and that, but it, I mean, we were, we were embarrassed. We're just it was is embarrassing to play so poorly when the expectations were so high, right? And so we had this big talk about embarrassment. We go out, we play. Um, we were playing against ASU. Bubba leads off with a double, and we're like, "It's going to be a great day." Bubba's at second. Ground ball. Next batter hits to shortstop. Bubba runs into the out, second to third. Like literally, right after we went high, like, "Oh, it's going to work today," right? Runs into the out, second to third, and I'm sitting in the dugout going, "His base running was part of our debacle, right?" She runs right into the out. And I put my head down for a quick second and just writing down what happened. And Bubba runs back to the dugout and she goes, I'm not going to be embarrassed. <laughs> and everybody started, I had to laugh too, because here I had this big speech. Like, what if we don't get embarrassed? Right. So Bubba said, and we all lost it for a quick second because everything in my mind is like, what are you doing? We're doing the same thing over and over. Captain obvious. Right. So she says, I'm not going to be embarrassed. And everybody kind of laughed. And then it was that moment where everyone just took a deep breath and said, all right, buy into this. Let's go. Cause my all American just had another knucklehead play, but we're going to flip it from what are you doing to, all right, let it go. We blew up that weekend just because there was, we let it go. 
it was it was an unbelievable thing. And everyone in the country looked at me and be like, oh, good luck with that. I could tell that to my team and it's not going to work. When you get your players dialed in and really, really clear about what they're focusing on in the moment, then great things can happen. And I can tell you, it takes moments like that from big players where you get tested, big speech, and it still doesn't work. But how you get them stay committed to the process, and now that becomes a tool for us. Do you guys remember that? This gen- it gets carried on from generation to generation. You remember that moment? And we still got tested, but then we still said, no, forget it. We're not going to go backwards. Those are those weapons that I think are so powerful, it, which is, like you said, the mental side. Because everyone's putting work in. Everyone's putting work in. There is no program in the country in Division One softball that doesn't put work in. But what separates the good from the great is your ability to manage success and failure and be able to get to the next pitch. And I think that's something that is constantly in working motion because we're, we're a sport of failure. Oh, my God. Just because you give me an answer, coach, doesn't mean it's going to work because I failed again. So I don't trust you anymore. No, until you trust yourself, it's going to continue to happen. It's not about me. It's about you as an athlete. And that's on a stage with no guarantees. Remember what you signed up for. Honestly, every time I talk to anybody associated with UCLA in a deep way, meaning a coach (laughs) or a former player, I I always end up thinking at some point in the conversation, like this is the the most positive, most successful, best, like cult, almost like the Bruin bubble that I've ever heard of. And I mean that in, in the highest regard, right? Because it's just the level of buy-in that you have. I appreciate it. But clear leadership, you know, Sharon brought us all together and Sue was very clear with your effort and your attitude is all you have control over. And she always, you know, she had a different delivery than I did yet. It, it is, it's, it's, it's a bigger picture. It's not about you. It's about how you're going to continue to carry this on. And that's, it's difficult. People say all the time, well, it's easy for you guys to have culture because you win. And I think it's just the opposite. I can tell you, we've had some amazing talent here. And when we didn't, the culture wasn't strong. We didn't get the outcome no matter how talented it was. And it's not to reveal anything. It's just in those moments when things got hard, we either went this way or that way, you know? And when, when times like when, right now we're getting challenged, there's no guarantees. You know, we, we knew this Kinsley's down and, and at, in Washington, we had Kinsley down and Anna down and Aaliyah down. I mean, it was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. That's let's bring that on. It's a good challenge. Not to mention every the media talking about Bubba and Rachel and all those guys. I'm so proud of our team. We just played ball. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't about anyone and it created a different opportunity for different people to, to step up because I've had that question. What are you going to do? Stacey Newman, reta- you know, graduated. Natasha Watley graduated. Megan Langefeld graduated. Lisa Fernandez graduated. I mean, I mean, you can go on and on, but it creates an opportunity for someone else to step up. Right now, Megan and Holly are, are doing a great job post the Rachel Garcia era, two-time Honda Cup winner. Oh my gosh, right? How do you yeah. fill those shoes? You don't. You just be the best version of yourself to help this team in 2022. And that, that is a big part of who we are, that it's about, you don't replace people. You just create opportunities for others. And if you want it, step to the plate and, and prepare to be that because it could be really, really fun. But there's also a lot of, it was very hard to be Rachel Garcia too. And she did a great job of being able to find consistency in herself and just came back to help the program. I'm grateful for her forever because she wasn't always healthy. But she always represented with class and did everything she could to help this program succeed, even though she was the most decorated. She'll go down in history as far as back to back Honda Cup. I mean, I don't know whoever does it again. I kudos to you because that was pretty big time of what she was able to do for the sport of softball. Right. It's definitely to be a Honda winner. Huge Honda Cup winner. Oh, my God. Back to back. That's a statement of where softball is in right now in this generation that they they valued what she was able to do amongst all other sports. That's what was so special about the back-to-back Honda Cup is the statement for the entire sport of softball, not just UCLA. Yep. Yep. And you're right. I think the class that she always had, which is again, a cultural tenant, but she was, she was just special, but it was one of those things where I, I love the point you just hit on, which is, it's not like she got to that point because she was trying to fill someone else's shoes. She came into her own shoes. You know, she stepped into her own shoes to do that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just proud of her because she's not a very, for her, She's very confident. She's a very confident girl, but she's not, it's, she doesn't want, she doesn't need the spotlight. She yeah. just yeah. liked to be, and she said it all the time, just having fun with my teammates, you know? And, and I, I left I'm like, do you want to expand on that? And she's like, no, I'm good. You know, like it's, and I think she did things went really well when she paired up with Lisa to be able to help her get that mental edge. Cause she's physically a beast, but being able to endure um, some great things, like life lessons were learned. Like, like she said, champ camp to actually believe, cause she's a worker to actually think you can work harder. She was like, wait, what, you know, but, and how Lisa went through that with her, 
those are the things that I love hearing that they're still talking about that because we all know the heart of the path, the greater the reward. You know, if it was easy, everybody would be great. But those, those athletes that can choose that harder path and know that it's not easy, man, the rewards are pretty big time at the end. Um, if you choose that path. Yep. Definitely. Yep. And yeah. I just feel like you're really good at uh, looking at the big picture too. The other thing, when you mentioned that you kind of have that acronym that you think of the entire yeah. sort of season with, and it's Bruins and each letter is a different phase. Yeah. Of the I, think, year. I think that what's the most important part of that is everybody has a long season. And if you're rolling, then that's great. But m- majority of seasons, man, we go through highs and lows. And if, if you're caught up in the emotion of the highs and lows of a season, I mean, that's tough when you're in a low and you're trying to grab them with a purpose they're, they could look at you like, you know, it's just bad right now. It's horrible. I'm not having fun. This isn't, you know, all of those things, but breaking it down into segments allows me to stop no matter where we are to be really clear about the B is fall building foundation academically, athletically, we're, we're, we're coming together in football. It's not our season, but it, it's hard. It's five days a week. We're grinding, you know? So we're really clear about what it is. So I'm giving them the idea, the bigger picture of what this is about. It is hard. You are waking up early. It is tiring. You know, all of those things, but this foundation allows you to be strong at the end. The R phase is for respect the program over Christmas break, you know, and we talk about that. that They're continuing to do work on their own is respecting the program so we can hit the ground running in January. So they go home with this. Oh, like, okay. Like we're all expected to work out. You know, I can't, I can't mandate it. I can't, I can't be a part of it yet. I hope that you for this program continue to train. And then the U phase is the unity phase of preseason where we learn a lot about ourselves. We're traveling, we're getting challenged, different lineups, different roommates, um, starting, non-starting, now numbers come into play, batting averages, all those things. So we learn a lot about ourselves in the unity phase and we're constantly addressing it. What are we learning? What are we learning? What are we learning? So, and we talk about teammates and how they're helping each other and mentalities or how they got through tough things. But once again, I always have the girls talk to it but we understand it's the unity phase. We're learning about each other. People are watching you, upperclassmen, how you're managing all of all of this. So we talk about it a lot, cut that off. The one is first part of Pac-12. So this whole first part is all about being the one. You know, even if we don't focus on who's down, we focus on who's going to step up. And I have no control over who it's going to be. So the lineup and all of that, I have no control. So who is going to be the one? I hope everyone is preparing to be the one. And that's a big part of why we've had different people step up because everyone has a chance to be the one and who is it going to be? I have no idea, but I can't wait to see at the end of the game, who it is, if it's going to be a Seneca Kuro, right. Or if it's going to be Alyssa Garcia, if it's going to be a little savvy Pola again, or if it's going to be Laney, there's so many opportunities to be the one that you have different people step up. If it's going to be Lauren Shaw on Sunday, you know, as a pitcher, but we're really promoting who wants it, who wants to be the one. And let's see who actually is the one at the end. And then, you know, we're going to finish up. We're going to go to Stanford. We have Stanford this weekend. And then that's the first half of pack. And then we're going to go and finish out the second half. And I can stop no matter what happens, stop again and say, now this is the never let up. You know, for us right now, we've had a great preseason and a great first part of pack, but now it's never let up for postseason. So I'm going to stop and address that. We're going to go back to attention to detail. We're going to go back to work. We're going to make sure cardio and, and fueling and school and all we can, we have the ability because it's just what we do. We're going to go back to fundamentals right in the middle of Pac-12 because this is what we do. Because it's very easy to just ride it out and be able to just let games go. But we're going to have an attention to it with a focus per game, per inning, per pitch. But as a coach, whether we're winning or we're losing, I can stop and say, this is the never let up phase. We're going back to work. We're going to refocus right now. And then obviously the S is postseason. So if we go through this with an attention to detail by the end, that's the bottom line. You want it to be successful in postseason, and there's no guarantees. You got to put the work in to fit, to have the confidence that you're prepared to be able to succeed at the end. Because if you can't cheat the game, you know, being able to get away with some success and then think it's going to show up at the end, that's a tough thing to do. And we've we've had we've had that too. So you know that that happens, and it and it exposes itself at the most revealing time, and that's that's rough, and that yeah. is embarrassing. You know, so as a coach, we've got to put yourself in a position to at least prepare as much as you can and then go for the ride in postseason if you're able to have that ride for postseason. But that's the goal for everyone in the country. Like we want to be there. So give yourself the best chance by putting in the preparation. And then you got to let them play at the end, knowing that we're prepared. There's no reason to do more. We're prepared. We've gone through it. We've learned. 
We know what it's going to take to live pitch to pitch. And then we'll see what happens. That's why I can walk away from any season knowing, man, we did everything we could as coaches. And now the rest is going to be experience on how we manage situations. And I think that part I love. I love seeing the opportunities in, 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 in any postseason to see how people step up and, and take advantage of them. And then there's always lessons learned. Always. Always. I feel like you're pitching staff right now, too. I mean, well, first of all, congrats on 700 wins as a head coach. Congrats Thank on this. You this huge win streak that you guys have going on right now. But I know in your mind, like you just said, like we're, you're not even close to done. Right. Yeah, no. And yeah, all of that. 100%. <laughs> go ahead and go ahead and finish your thought. Like we're, we're just in the process. And I, it, we, I definitely don't get up and get caught up in, in any of that. I, I like that we were challenged and I like to see adversity once again, to be able to learn. Cause I've also been a part of teams where we've just killed it. And then we got to the end and during challenge, you're like, oh God, we're not prepared for this because hmm. we've had so much success that it's, you know, a, a big, a big part of it is what you do after that. That's what postseason is all about. Cause you could be rolling and be the best team in the country. And if you get a sock in the face and you're not ready to punch back, you know, that's, you don't want to learn that at the end, you want to be able to deal with adversity. So yes, it records, rankings, all of that. It's day to day. What are we doing today? It's irrelevant. Right. I feel like in the preseason too, having played, you know, Florida state and the primetime game doing all that stuff. Like that was a test playing Oklahoma, right? That was a test, but your pitching staff feels like they just keep getting better and better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but I think that's what it's, that's what it is. It's a lesson learned, you know, after that, I mean, that Florida state game, I, I was so proud of them. It could have gone, it could have gone either way. Had we not gone a tiebreaker and someone had to, but we don't get caught up in that. I just love how we competed. You know, like we, we competed, Aaliyah just went down. We were in an emotional state of, okay, let's reshuffle and, and figure this out. And, and um, I loved it. I loved how, you know, Megan went at it and, and I had just said, well, you know, her strength is pounding the zone and sometimes her downfall because she'll, but she, she didn't shy away. It's one thing if she starts just falling off the rails. I mean, the girl got beat on certain pitches, but then now she's better for it, you know, but it got an opportunity for Holly to come in and actually do well. So there was positives from just how he competed Tessa's ball. I think we had bases loaded there in, in the extra inning and could have easily have gapped that ball. And that would have been a whole different game and theirs went through and ours didn't. But I think at the end of the day, I loved how we competed and that we didn't get the outcome because there's some things that we could have taken advantage of prior to, or what did we learn? So as a coach, you walk away with a W, everything is all washed. Like you're like, <laughs> Oh, that was awesome. We won. But as a coach on the flip side, we got to learn some lessons and take a deep dive into what is it going to take so that you're not a click off from being on the other side? Um, and same thing in the Northwestern game, you know, they, they did a great job of competing and their pitcher was great, but when we needed to, an extra inning stood up, we got it. We got two more runs on the board and did a great job, but, but the error on defense cost us the game. So it wasn't me. Ma- yeah. Megan gave up the bomb on a, whatever the count was a two strike count down two outs, whatever. But it was the fact that the defensive decision gave them that other opportunity that we got to learn. From that, yes, Megan needs to be better and have her back. And the defense, but everyone was very vocal about what we could have done different in that game. So I, that's the part of coaching that I think everybody, um, no one likes to lose, but everyone can learn a lot about yourselves in failure more than you can when you get away with a W. So I'm, but I'll take the W. Please believe I'm not that coach. I don't want a lot of losses, but I think it's it's about lessons learned, probably more yeah. than anything. And we've we've been able to learn and continue to grow. And I think that's what this is all about year to year is that's what it is. The process, the process, the process. Yeah. It seems like the different dynamics that you have too, personality wise, I mean, can help in that way. Like everyone has their own thoughts on, on what you can do. Like you said, Holly's like actually pretty swaggy, you know, she's got like a, like a spicy personality, which which I like. (laughs) Well, I think, I think, well, I think everyone's their own individual. And another, another thing that we talk about is being the best version of yourself. So I always, I tell the girls, often and i say it often is 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 operate within your strength zone know what you're really good at because by nature we don't know what we're great at okay you can say what you're, we need to be better at and even as females right guys can talk about themselves really easy i am it girls by nature don't always and not to be stereotypical but it, it seems to be something that can be common so once again operate within your strength zone but outside your comfort zone that means know what you're great at but man always push to be better don't be, don't settle for that. And that's where I say each individual is different. So to be the best version of yourself, be very clear. And I like for them to embrace who they are. They don't all have to just 
be Bruins that represent a certain way, be the best version of yourself. And for us as coaches, we have to learn about each individual that some people now within the guidelines of how we all represent UCLA, but I like for them to be able to feel comfortable with who they are. You are here because you have succeeded being the best version of yourself. Okay. Now we've got to continue to do that and work to get better. And if we can do that, then you see people thrive. Too many people come into a program and they get lost with their identity because they're trying to be what they think they should be and they forget who they are. And then all of a sudden you're like, God, that player was really good. What happened to her? You know, and, and they, they just forget who they, who they were. And that's what I love is for our coaching staff really embraces the individual and our job is to bring out the best in the individual, not just them having to be a Bruin. And I think that's once again, following your word, being the best version of yourself, that's for the bigger picture beyond the white lines. They've got to walk out of here more powerful, confident females of knowing who they are and how to articulate that, um, you know, in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. It's always bigger than softball. Like you said, I mean, it is, it is, it's, I, I being a part of it too, like you can, you can do everything right and things don't go, things don't go or in the same breath, you know, things can, you can have a little bit of luck and things keep going forward. So it cannot be your full identity. That is our goal. And that is my job. But at the end of the day, the reality is you don't have control over everything. So the lessons learned and how you represent yourself and we're fortunate to be on TV. So there's a lot more people than just the softball world watching us that your ability to show how you manage it, man, that's the secret sauce that people will want you to be a part of their next thing, because look at how she handles that. She obviously is successful, but man, she can handle the hard stuff. That's attractive. Everybody wants that to help an organization or family or company be better. Yeah. Yep. In terms of identity too, are you still, how are you feeling about identifying Megan as the two-way player she came in as to the program now? Cause I know you're like, well, I like it, but you know, we want her to stay healthy. Well, I mean, I can simply say, I think the whole country, if anyone watched actually, whoever watched, um, obviously she is a two-way player. She can swing it and she's, she's hit the home run, but I also recently had her get the green lights to keep running home and she dove into home. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is, you know, so it's a tough thing. I can, as I've described, I believe defense wins championships that allows you to come up with that timely hit. So we'll see, there's going to be moments where Megan can be a part and there's going to be moments where Megan's really going to focus on the defense end, but she is a true two way. Um, here's the thing. This is, she's a true two way that loves to dive. So if I could get that dive out of her and, and she could be right next to me right now going, coach, I promise I won't, but then it, it'll, it'll come out, but that would just not be a good story for, for us, you know, um, to risk it. But um, it, I'm not worried about her. It's just, we have different opportunities and she has come through in some big moments and sometimes strategically we go in a different way. And I'm fortunate to have those options. Um, but Megan is a beast no matter what. And if I had an opportunity to have anyone in a situation offensively, defensively, I would always pick her because that girl, she's got some, she has a special DNA about her. She does it all right. She works hard. She's a great team player. And I believe the game pays her back. Really. She's, 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 she's definitely special. Well, we've talked about this. Cause I, I mentioned to you, like I've always loved that pitchers who hit hitters who pitch, whatever you want to call it, you know, legacy at UCLA, you have the Lisa Fernandez, you know, yeah. Amanda Freed, Megan Fuller, yeah. Langenfeld. And then you have, you know, Rachel Garcia and like there's Megan, but I think to your point, it's like, yeah, everybody's different though. And yeah. it's, it's, what's going to be best for the team. And that seems like for Megan, for you, for everybody, that is always number one. Yeah. Yeah. And she does a great, she does it all. She hits, she pitches she every day. And then, and I'm fortunate that I have the luxury to be able to put her in as needed versus once again, it's all about me. I want to hit. She is the epitome of whatever's best for this team. So I'm, I'm fortunate. Yeah. But she is definitely a threat at the plate. I, I absolutely love when she gets the stick in her hands because anything can happen. She's so strong. She hits the ball. She hits the ball further, farther than anyone on our team, hands down in batting practice. It's like, she's got a different level of strength. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah I mean, that home run that hit the scoreboard, I was like, <laughs> I don't know if that scoreboard survived, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh my gosh, she's so strong. So yes, we're fortunate. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Any well, I, I could, you know, I could keep you here all day, especially when you told me it was an off day earlier. I'm like, oh, so does that mean <laughs> we can just talk all day? But no, well, I, I hope you edit because I'm talking a lot. <laughs> you better edit this, not make me look like a babbling crazy. You know, I, I, I think I, we're still on, I know, but I think I'm passionate <laughs> about it and have, I have, it's, it's storytelling on how I coach more than just, you know, focus on the fundamentals. And we have that. But to get people to buy into the how, the process, there when you have meaning, and 
that's in, in anything in life, right? If you're motivated and there's meaning behind it, you will be more passionate about it. To just be told what to do, there is a method to that madness. Just get to it. Just tell me what to do and don't be so worried. Um, I agree. But we are more inspired because of the stories and the, the lessons learned and the experiences. We call it Bruin Magic. I mean, if you work really hard and you have a positive attitude, some crazy things can happen. And But there's work that needs to be put in for that to happen. Don't think that just happens. Um, so I wrap up every conversation with a little game called Safer Out. Mm-hmm. And basically, I'll just bring something up, a topic. And if you like it or agree with it, you'll call it safe. If you don't, okay. you'll call it out. Make sense? Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. So first one is the conference tournament, like the PAC 12 tournament next year, safer out. Safe. I figured it'll be fun, right? It's been a long time not having it. I think there's positives on how, on what's best for the PAC 12. And I'm all about that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think the attention will be good for sure. Especially before postseason. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So first one's safe. Second one is name image likeness, AKA student athletes getting paid safer out. Uh, Definitely safe as well. It's all about opportunity for the student athletes. And that's what this is. It's taking advantage of opportunities um, and they get to work on building their own brand to, to, to have the the possible benefits. So um, completely nothing but a positive on opportunity for them. Yeah. And I think about that because I remember Jessica Mendoza, one of the things she brought up on the show, especially was the branding for that life after college, you know, and building a career out of it and how important that is. And I think for women in particular could be a real opportunity. 100%. Yeah. Okay, cool. A couple of safe so far. All right. So the last one is bat flips safer out. Um, that would be an out for, for us, definitely. And I really have no comment except for that I just don't agree with any individual um, being able to take advantage of an opportunity, but that's just us. So out for UCLA softball. Yeah, I think just based on this entire conversation, anyone listening would have been able to guess your answer there. Yeah. Just, you know, it's team, right? Like that's been the theme. So it makes total sense that yeah. I, I just think there's a respect level too of just, you know, you, you did something great and then, you know, that your team gets to benefit from it. So, but everyone has their ways of doing it. So it's just out for UCLA softball. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you said out for everyone too, like the whole program, not just you, because I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So that's it. So you got a couple runners on, but didn't load them up, but I have really enjoyed this conversation. Hopefully I get to say hello to you in person this weekend too, because I'm actually going to be calling your games uh, against Stanford. So hopefully I can yeah. come say hello. Come, by, come, yeah, come down and say hello. I think it'll be fun. You know, and then I also just wanted to, this is completely separate, but I've had an opportunity to be on a coaching cohort with uh, Dave Esker, uh, which is super cool. I know. And so I've had a chance to get to know him and just the the secret sauce behind his program and just the way, you know, Stanford baseball does things. And it was, it's really exciting. So I hope I bump into a bunch of you on campus. It'll be fun this weekend because I know they're in town as well. Yes. And he's awesome. I got to talk with him a little bit more in detail because I do some of the Stanford baseball games as well. He's great. I think the softball yes. players work with him too, for like different clinics and things, which That's is pretty cool. cool right. Yeah. 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 You can tell he also gets bigger picture on, on, on being a part of a program. So, um, I really enjoy learning from him, um, collaborating with him as well. So yeah, hopefully I'll bump into a couple of you on campus this weekend, but we look forward to coming up and visiting. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, okay, thank well, you thank coach. You. Thank you. For, yeah. Thank you for having me, man. If Kelly, I doesn't get you fired up, then I don't know what will. Their approach at UCLA is just the epitome of honoring tradition while making your own mark, which I think is a great place to be. And I'm going to be on the call, like I said, for the series this weekend against Stanford. So please tune in on Pac-12 Plus and go Stanford.com. It is completely sold out in person. It's going to be a good one. I'm excited. So with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about failing forward. See, Kelly talked a lot about this in our conversation. The idea of coming back after failure, or more specifically, how you react in the next moment after you fail. And it's not about whether or not you fail. You know, she said it, you will fail. It's not actually a question, but it's how you fail. 
And that's why I love the Lisa Fernandez stat so much that they talk about. It's one of the biggest things that I look at as a broadcaster is how players react to situations. For pitchers, if you give up a home run, what are you going to do in the next pitch against the next batter? Same with a defender who makes an error or a hitter who strikes out. How are you going to use the failure to make you better versus allowing it to make you bitter? And to me, it's a wasted opportunity if you just let yourself get emotional or reactive versus taking the information from that failure to give you a chance to be successful next time. So, you know, if you throw a pitch over the wide of the plate and you get lit up, adjust, hit that corner next time. If you sit back on a ground ball and you get eaten up in the infield, you charge that ball next time. If you chase the rise ball in the box and you're looking at the next step back, get the timing down, see the ball all the way in and lay off of it next time. Just channel that frustration into focus. And all of a sudden failure isn't destructive. It's actually productive. So that's it. Fail forward. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of the Believe Network and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com. And you can watch the videos on YouTube too. Subscribe, rate, and write a review for the show. I always appreciate your support and hearing what you think. It's awesome. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's again, B L E A V. And you can always reach out to me on Twitter at JennaBacera01 and Instagram at JennaBacera as well. As always, thank you for tuning in and catch you soon.